what I want you to do is uh, stand with me if you would. We're going to read, I'm going, I'm going to read uh, a couple of portions, and as you should be familiar by now, we're, we're well into this study, that the, that the theme verses that I read or the highlighted verses that I read to introduce this book are also the ones that constitute key passages, so you'll see them again. But I wanted you to hear this. 2 Corinthians, the, 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 what, we're, what we're considering this as, there's a couple of moving themes in 2 Corinthians. But one of them that we're looking at is Paul's defense of his apostolic authority. Okay, 2 Corinthians 4, verses 5 and 6. We'll read that first. And then 2 Corinthians 5, 17 to 19. 2 Corinthians 4, 5, and 6. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And then 2 Corinthians 5. Verse 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All thing is from God. All, thing, all this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. This is critical. It's a a ministry of reconciliation. It's a message of reconciliation. Christ himself is our reconciliation. I've said this before. If you want to try to find one word, if you want to try to hang the gospel on one word, it is the word reconciliation. So we've read together what tonight? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient word of God. And may the Lord help us to to expand our appreciation and understanding of 1 Corinthians that we're, that we're walking through at ground level with shovels in our hands by flying over 2 Corinthians and, and giving us some more perspective and depth to the study. All right. Thank you. You may be seated. We're going to uh, show the, the Bible Project video, about eight, eight and a half minutes. And again, this is, uh, I have a real appreciation for what they've done here. I think in many respects... They've captured the essence of this of this letter. While he's looking for that, Michelle fell ill this afternoon and, and sent us a note a while ago that she would not make it. And so, uh, as usual, we have, we have guys that are willing to just grab the bull by the horns and tackle it and make it happen. And it'll happen here in a minute. Norman, you just give me the sign as to whether or not you want me to go on and then we, we come back and watch this or just whatever, you're, whatever you think we should do. <laughs> 
Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. Even though it's called 2nd or 2 Corinthians in our Bibles, there are multiple clues within this letter that it's not the second thing he ever wrote to the church of ancient Corinth. Paul started this Jesus community in Corinth some time ago on one of his missionary journeys. You can read the story in the book of Acts chapter 18. And after moving on, Paul got a report that things were not going well there. So he wrote the letter that we call 1 Corinthians to correct these problems. And it appears that many in the church rejected Paul's teaching in that letter and rebelled against his authority. And so we learn in this letter that Paul had followed up in person with what he calls the painful visit. And after that, he sent a letter which he says was written with anguish and tears. And so after all these measures, most but not all of the Corinthians realized their arrogance and they apologized to Paul. They wanted to reconcile. And so Paul wrote this letter to assure them of his love and commitment. The letter's been designed with three main sections, each addressing a distinct topic. So Paul first finalizes his reconciliation with the Corinthians. Then in chapters 8 and 9, he addresses the topic of forgotten generosity. And in the final chapters, Paul challenges the remaining Corinthians who still reject him. Let's dive in and you'll see how it all works. So Paul opens up by thanking the God of all mercy and comfort who brought peace and encouragement to him and the Corinthians during this time of division and dispute. He acknowledges that things have been tense since this painful visit and he makes clear he's forgiven them. He wants an open and honest relationship. But why had they rejected Paul in the first place? Well, we discover later in this letter that the Corinthians had disregarded Paul as a leader. He was poor. He earned a meager living through manual labor. He was under constant persecution and suffering. He was often homeless. And to top it off, he wasn't a very impressive public speaker. And so once the Corinthians were exposed to other more wealthy, impressive Christian leaders, they started to think less of Paul. They were actually ashamed of him. So Paul responds first by showing that their elevation of these leaders simply because of their wealth and eloquence is a betrayal of Jesus. It shows a totally distorted value system. True Christian leadership, Paul says, is not about status or self-promotion. Paul depicts himself and the other apostles as captive slaves to King Jesus, who's leading them on a procession of triumph. Paul's job isn't to be impressive, but rather to point people to the one who is. Jesus. He then alludes to the recent demand of the Corinthians that he provide some letters of recommendation to prove his authority and credentials. And this is ridiculous to Paul. Their church wouldn't even exist if he hadn't started it. And so he says they are his proof of genuine leadership. They are his letter of recommendation. He cleverly quotes from the prophets Jeremiah and Ezekiel saying that God's spirit has written his letter of recommendation on their hearts as his new covenant people. The Corinthians shouldn't need Need any more proof than that. Now, the mention of the new covenant, it leads Paul into a long comparison between the old covenant between God and Israel that was mediated by Moses and the new covenant between God and the Corinthians mediated by Jesus and the Spirit. The old covenant made at Mount Sinai, it was truly glorious. It made Moses himself shine with God's glory, but that glory eventually faded. Not to mention the fact that the laws of that covenant were ineffective at truly transforming Israel. But the new covenant, by comparison, is even more glorious because the resurrected Jesus is the very glory of God and he lives on forever. And it's his spirit that's now transforming people to become more faithful just like Jesus himself. Now, this all sounds amazing. I mean, who doesn't want to share in God's own glory? But Paul goes on to show how the paradox of the cross turns upside down the Corinthians' ideas of glory and success. After all, Jesus' glorious exaltation as king took place through his suffering, execution, and death. On the cross, Jesus revealed God's salvation. He died for the sins of the world to reconcile people to God. But the cross does even more. It reveals God's character. He's a being of utter self-giving, suffering love that seeks the well-being of others. The cross also reveals a new cruciform way of life. And Paul's goal is that his life and ministry imitates the cross. So although his apostolic career it has been marked by humility, suffering, by poverty, it was all to serve the Corinthians. And so when they disapprove of Paul's poverty and suffering, they disapprove of Jesus too. Paul's way of life and leadership is actually the proof that he authentically represents the crucified and risen Jesus. Paul really wants to reconcile with the Corinthians, but he won't let things lie until they've been transformed and embrace this upside-down paradox of the cross. 
After this passionate appeal, Paul moves on to address the topic of forgotten generosity. So the Jewish Christians back in Jerusalem, they had fallen into poverty due to a famine. And Paul was raising money among the new churches that he started, full of mostly non-Jews. They would all send a relief gift as a symbol of their unity in the Messiah, Jesus. And so many of his churches, they were thrilled to give. But the Corinthians, in the midst of all this conflict with Paul, hadn't saved up for the gift. And for Paul, this isn't just about money. It's another sign that the Corinthians have not been transformed by the gospel about Jesus, which at its heart is a story of generosity. Paul says, you know the generous grace of our Lord Jesus the Messiah, that even though he was rich, for your sake he became poor, so that through his poverty you might become rich. He's telling the story of the gospel through financial metaphors. Jesus gave up his glorious honor, or wealth, and he lowered himself to die like a poor slave, so that other people who are impoverished through sin and death can be exalted and become wealthy through the riches of God's grace. To be a Christian is to let this story sink deep into your mind and heart, letting it transform you into someone who's more generous, more willing to share your life and resources to help others. In the final section of the letter, Paul focuses on the main source of his conflict with the Corinthians, that group of impressive leaders that he sarcastically calls super apostles. So they came to Corinth promoting themselves and badmouthing Paul as a poor, unsuccessful leader. And at the risk of sounding self-promoting, Paul says, do these guys really want to compare credentials? He can totally take them on. Are they Jewish Bible experts? Well, so is Paul. He was a Pharisee, for goodness sakes. He has the whole Bible memorized. Do they want to brag about their superior knowledge of Jesus? Paul has actually seen and hung out with the risen Jesus. He's actually had visions of Jesus' heavenly throne room. But more importantly, Paul has given his entire life to the mission of Jesus. He sacrificed comfort and stability, and he never asked the Corinthians for money. Unlike the super apostles who charged a lot, Paul earned his own living. But, Paul says, he refuses to brag about these accomplishments because these aren't the things that really matter as a Christian. Instead, what he'll brag about is how flawed and how weak he is because it's in those inadequacies that he discovers the love and mercy of Jesus. Or as Jesus once told Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, my power is made perfect through weakness. Paul concludes the letter with a sober warning to the Corinthians. They need to check themselves. Their contempt for Paul, his way of life, their love for these super apostles, it all shows that they don't grasp who Jesus is on a fundamental level. They're not living like transformed followers of Jesus, and so he invites them once again to humble themselves before the love of Jesus. 2 Corinthians gives us a really unique window into the life of Paul and the paradox set before us by the cross of Jesus. The cross challenges our values, our ways of seeing the world. We value success, education, wealth, but God values humility and weakness because his love and power were made known through the suffering, death, and the resurrection of Jesus. The cross also unleashes the transforming power and presence of the Spirit to empower Jesus' followers to take up his cruciform way of life and make it their own. And that's what 2 Corinthians is all about. Thank you, brother, for wrestling with that until you, until you pinned it. Appreciate that. All right, we're going to look at a summary of 2 Corinthians, just a brief paragraph statement, and remember to remind you of the theme passage that's before us every week, and uh, which is driving us all the way through the scriptures. Since Paul's first letter, some folks, we call them the Judaizers, that's that's just a description that's been given by people who are trying to, to uh, give you an understanding of who they are. They're people basically who, from a Jewish background, who would say that they have, they have trusted themselves, their lives, to Jesus as the Messiah. But they've not abandoned Jewish ceremonial law. And so they would have you believe that to embrace Jesus, you've got to embrace these other things. That's the best picture you can give of the Judaizers. A, a less uh, flattering picture would be that among them may well have been some of these folks who, had, who, were, who were pretending to be followers of Jesus, 
and some of the crowd that had sworn that they would take Paul down because of his betrayal of Judaism. So there's this, this group of this mixed group. And so they've come in behind him, as happens many times in his ministry. Uh, they begin making claims, charges of him. That Paul's fickle, proud, unimpressive in appearance, unimpressive in his speech, dishonest, unqualified as an apostle. Those are the, some of the descriptions that you'll pick up when you read through uh, these things. So Paul sent Titus to Corinth to deal with these difficulties. And upon his return, he heard that the Corinthians had had a change of heart, by and large, most of them, not all of them. So Paul wrote this letter to express his thanksgiving for the repentant majority, to appeal to the rebellious minority to accept his authority. So throughout the book, this, <clears throat> these outcroppings, he defends his conduct, he defends his character, defends his calling as an apostle, Jesus Christ. And I'm sure this was not an easy thing when you, when you respond to the call of God upon your life to, to engage in ministry. You want to follow Jesus, be like Jesus. You want to embrace the humility of the cross, as you, as you heard talked about there. And to, to rise up to defend is a difficult thing. And so this is kind of what, what you're going to see in the book. If you can outline, we've done these outlines as well. The place of writing of it, and this is it's probably Macedonia, uh, 56 A.D. approximately. And the, uh, the outline breaks down as follows. You have this, this explanation of Paul's ministry, which is in chapter 1, verse 1, through chapter 7, verse 16, where it takes up, as we said, the character of Paul. Um, He's, he tells them why he's gone from Ephesus to Macedonia, the, had a change of, of itinerary. Uh, he explains his plans, the change of plans. He gives them his philosophy of ministry in chapter 2, 14 through chapter 6, 10. Then he gives an exhortation to them to, to close out this section, the rest of chapter 6 and into chapter 7. The second thing he takes up in chapters 8 and 9 is this collection of the saints. If you've ever wondered as you read through the New Testament, as he references the collection, the collection. Jerusalem, as you remember, was suddenly found itself a church of Jesus Christ birthed there on Pentecost. Thousands, multiplied thousands, many of whom did not return home, formed the church in Jerusalem, pastored by, by the apostles who were there. Um, then a famine followed. The church was scattered through persecution, and yet Jerusalem, the saints in Jerusalem struggled. So Paul made it his, one of his missions that when he would go into an area, and, and the Lord would be pleased to plant a church in Gentile areas, primarily Gentile, predominantly Gentile, that he would challenge them to show their love for the saints in Jerusalem and to, and to close any gap that was, and there was a gap. If you remember Acts 15, the the Jerusalem Council, there was this notion going on that you, among folks of Jewish uh, descent who had become Christians, that you really can't become a true Christian unless you become a proselyte Jew first. And so Paul was using this opportunity to, true, to demonstrate true benevolence, but also to show tangibly to these Jewish background believers in, in Jerusalem that, that the Gentiles had indeed been transformed. They had a heart of compassion for them. And so you have this collection for the saints and uh, in, in Macedonia, he was preparing to visit Corinth. Um, there's this example of the Macedonians that he commends to them, and then he exhorts the Corinthians in the light of that as well. And then the third part of this outline is that Paul vindicates his apostleship in chapter 10 through the end of the, of the, of the letter. Uh, he argues about his credentials. Uh, and then... Uh, references his, the eminence of his, of his visit. He answers uh, his accusers. He defends uh, his authority, and he mentions that he'll be coming to see them. Uh, this, we're not getting in too deep in the weeds here. The textual challenge is the painful visit in chapter 2, verse 1. Is that, is that something we don't know about is he mentions another letter. Is that a letter we don't have? It's very uh, difficult. We'll do a little, that a little more when we get into a, his author, the authorship of this. Um, 
in, in 2 Corinthians, probably more than any book in the New Testament, you get this, what one writer called uh, the anatomy of an apostle. When you read through that, you really get a sense of, of how Paul saw his calling from the Lord. And so he spells out things uh, that really and truly I mean, he would have preferred not to, I'm sure. And the, the, point is not, the point is not that Paul's feelings have been hurt. Paul recognized that to the extent that these Judaizers succeeded in undermining Paul's character, undermining the confidence of the people in him, they would undermine the message he proclaimed. And that was what for Paul was at stake here. Uh, so he, he gives this, uh, if, you, if you want to, in the book, uh, after, after greetings and thanksgiving to God, uh, gives this explanation, uh, wanting to know why he hadn't come yet. It's not because he is, he's fickle. He's not, he's not vacillating as he's been accused. Um, then he, he, he challenged them to restore the repentant offender, remember? And he, he speaks, I want to look at that real quick. Look over at chapter 2. Um, pick up in verse 5. Now, if anyone has caused pain, he's caused it not to me, but in some measure, not to put it too severely, to all of you. Now, what are you talking about there? That if, if someone has attacked him, it's going to hurt them in terms of their receiving the truth. For such a one, this punishment by the majority is enough. And now he's taking up the, the uh, thing you mentioned in 1 Corinthians 5. So you should rather turn and forgive and comfort him. So apparently what has happened, in 1 Corinthians 5, he says you've got someone there, who a, a young man who is having an immoral relationship with his, with his stepmother, with his father's wife, that kind of language. Remember, we looked at that in, in chapter 5. And uh, he said, hand him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. I've already done it. You should have too. Your boasting about, about having not done it is, is not good. And so apparently when they did that, they followed Paul's uh, admonition, and the man uh, repented. So he says the majority agreed to carry out Paul's instructions. There were some who didn't. And he says now you should rather turn to forgive and comfort him. He's repented to them. Or he may be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. The the, as you move down the path of church discipline, we've talked about this before, we've taught on this before, we will be practicing this again in the coming weeks with, uh, with a member, uh, with my daughter, who has, and we'll go into that in detail when we, when we actually carry that out. But if there's a true repentance, then you don't want to leave them out there hanging. You don't want the devil. One of the things the devil does is he lies to people. He lies to you and me. And he will, he will tell the person who's come under discipline that uh, you're not loved. They don't want any more to do with you. They've washed their hands of you. You've blown as you've gone too far. So Paul's t- saying here, so that uh, you not be over- overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. So I beg you to reaffirm your love for him. For this is why I wrote, that I might test you and know whether you are obedient in everything. Anyone whom you forgive, I also forgive. Indeed, what, what I have forgiven... If I have forgiven anything has been for your sake in the presence of Christ so that we would not be outwitted by Satan. See there what he's talking about? For we are not ignorant of his design. So there's the, there's the danger. Watch the two ditches here. To fail to carry out redemptive corrective discipline in the life of someone who has taken on an immoral lifestyle falls into one ditch of the devil. He, he casts dispersion on the integrity of the congregation. To carry it out, however in a way that is, that is not redemptive but is harsh and punitive also gives him occasion. So, the, so there's, a, there's a gospel path we walk on to, uh, to exercise this in every aspect of the gospel. And so he has this uh, operating. And then at, at this point he goes into this, uh, this defense of his ministry. Uh, I want to read this to you just to give you a flavor of it in chapter, chapter 2, verse, verse 12. When I came to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ, even though a door was open for me in the Lord, my spirit was not at rest because I did not find my brother Titus there. So I took leave of them and went on to Macedonia. He wanted to reconnect with Titus. And I love this section here. Listen to this. But thanks be to God who in Christ, 
always leads us in triumphal procession. When you think you've been defeated, no, no, in Christ, always leads us in triumphal procession and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. This is a picture of incense of the of the priest who would be walking in procession and waving these incense containers and, and there's this aroma wafting on the air. So he always does this. The knowledge of Christ everywhere. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved. So this aroma here for Paul is not only the gospel being spread, but it goes up to God. God sees and rejoices in and accepts our faithful diligence among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. So when you're faithful, gospel faithfulness, that aroma to to heaven is precious. Whether the response to your your gospel message and your gospel practice is people coming to faith in Christ or them rejecting the message in the ministry and maybe even you because you happen to be the messenger. To the one, a fragrance from death to death. That would be those who are perishing. But you've, you've seen this. You've shared the gospel with people who, uh, and I'm doing this right now with some folks, and it's a stench to them. It's offensive. Uh, just sharing the truth of the gospel. It's death unto death. They're dead, and when, they, when, when, you, when you waft the aroma of the gospel, it just is recoiled against with, with an even more deadly attitude. To the other, a fragrance from life to life. To those who res- receive the gospel, respond to the gospel, it's, it's precious. It's wonderful. To you who believe, he is precious, the scripture said. And then he says this, who is sufficient for these things? No person, no mere person on his own is sufficient to make this happen. In fact, you feel, a, if, you, if you've faithfully engaged people with the gospel, you know you feel a, a true insufficiency in that. He says, for we are not like so many peddlers of God's word. Now he's talking, he's, he's, he's referencing these super apostles he's going to get to later. But as men of sincerity, as commissioned by God, in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. It's a powerful beginning to his defense of his, of his ministry. If you haven't read that, I'd encourage you to read through of Second Corinthians. Then he gets into the collection, as I said, in chapters 8 and 9, and, and he commends uh, the Macedonians and challenges the Corinthians to, to follow uh, their example. Um, Second Corinthians uh, 13, if you want to look at this in this defense of his apostleship, as he closes out the letter, so that they don't think that he... In, 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 In defending his apostleship and calling into question the the super apostles, as he calls them, that he's angry, that he's that he's uh, that it's all personal with him. Finally, brothers, rejoice. Aim for restoration. Because the people in Corinth were divided over this. Some appreciated the ministry of Paul. Some some had begun to question it. Comfort one another. Agree with one another. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. This Trinitarian benediction and blessing. This is so that they don't misunderstand. Paul's affection for the Corinthians is is unquestioned. He's just had to deal with some difficult things with them. Now, as far as the, uh, as the title of it, um, there's this, we told you last week that if you could read the, the, the Greek, it would be pros Corinthios uh, alpha. This is pros Corinthios beta. In other words, the, the second to the Corinthians. Um, Paul's authorship is not really questioned. Uh, what is questioned about this, though, is the, uh, is the unity of this, this letter. Uh, for example, I want to read you this here. Many critics theorize that chapters 10 to 13 were not a part of this letter. 
in its original form because the tone contrasts with that of chapters 1 to 9. It's held that the sudden change from a spirit of joy and comfort to a spirit of concern and self-defense, that's chapters 10 to 13, points to what some call a seam between two different letters. Many hypotheses have been advanced to explain the problem, but the most popular is that chapters 10 to 13 belong to a lost letter referred to in chapter 2, verse 4. Look over there real quick just so you're seeing, you're seeing what they're talking about. For I wrote to you out of much affliction and anguish of heart with many tears. The question is, 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 that, is he talking about 1 Corinthians when he, when he references that? And people, scholars are split on that. Several problems arise with these attempts to dissect uh, 2 Corinthians. Uh, Chapters 10 to 13 do not fit Paul's description of the lost letter in chapter 2 because they are firm uh, but not sorrowful and because they do not refer to the offender about whom that letter was written. And just so you know, I, I I don't buy into this. I believe that there is a letter that's missing, but I don't believe it's incorporated in this, this letter. This is, a, this is a unit whole, I believe. And so in 1 Corinthians 2, 5 to 11, he says, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Yet among the mature, we do, not, we, we do impart wisdom, although it is not a wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. But we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it's written, what no eye has seen, no ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him, these things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. So he goes on in this point is in this chapter 2 that it seems like this all fits together. Uh, And we just have to grant that in the wisdom of God, there's a letter he wrote that is not available to us, that, that the Holy Spirit did not deem necessary to be a part of the canon. And so then we the next thing we look at, Pauline authorship is established. There's no one who seriously challenges it is the, uh, the date and the setting. And we've already talked about that a little bit last week in 1 Corinthians. Uh, he was in Ephesus when he wrote 1 Corinthians and expected Timothy to visit Corinth and return to him. Look at 1 Corinthians 16, 10 to 11. He says, when Timothy comes, see that you put him at ease among you, for he's doing the work of the Lord as I am. So let no one despise him. Help him on his way in peace that he may return to me, for I'm expecting him with the brothers. And so it's in this, if you follow that chronology, it's when Timothy brought this report uh, to Paul of this opposition that had arisen because of these folks that had come in behind Paul and undermined his ministry. Uh, and so he, uh, there appears to be, as was referenced in the, uh, in the video, that Paul makes this brief painful visit to Corinth. It's not mentioned in Acts. We, don't, we can't piece this together with the chronology of Acts, but I want to just show you a couple of things here in 2 Corinthians. Look at 2 Corinthians 2, 1. For I made up my mind to make another painful visit to you. 2 Corinthians 12, 14. Here for the third time I'm ready to come to you, and I will not be a burden, for I seek not what is yours but you. For children are not obligated to save up for their parents, but parents for their children. And then chapter 13, 1 and 2. This is the third time I'm coming to you. Every charge must be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. He said, we're going to deal with this, these charges leveled against me. I warned those who sinned before and all the others, and I warned them now while absent, as I did when present on my second visit, that if I come again, I will not spare them. We're not going to take this lightly. So as I said, when you read the chronology of Acts, you're missing a visit missing a visit, but he's, he's referencing this, these times that he's coming to see them. Um, so apparently he wrote this sorrowful letter when he returned to Ephesus. And we'll just have to grant that we don't, uh, we don't have it here. 
Well, what about the theme and the purpose? I think you know by now uh, Paul writes this to defend his apostolic credentials and authority. And you see this glaringly in chapters 10, verse 13. But it really, as I said, it, it crops up throughout chapters 1, verse 9. It's, it's not like he just, this is why I think we need to reject this notion that, that the tone abruptly changes. No, the tone intensifies in chapters 10, verse 13. The false apostles is another term that's used uh, to, uh, to challenge their authority, their self-asserted uh, authority. He rejoices that the gospel triumphs. We see that in chapters 1 to 7, and I read you that portion from chapter 2. It's important for Paul to remind them, God always leads us in triumphant procession. Paul was not defeated. He didn't feel like his time at Corinth was wasted. But he was, he was not going to ignore the, the debilitating effects of someone coming in and undermining his character challenging his authority and all the different things they did. And so he talks in, in, uh, in chapter 7 about this godly sorrow and repentance. And he makes this distinction. I don't know if you've ever, if you've noticed this. Uh, let me pick up to show you. Look at chapter 7, verse 10. Let me, let's back up to verse 8. Let's give context here. He says, for even, this is chapter 7, verse 8. For even if I made you grieve with my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it. I mean, so he's, he's, he's saying... He's not, he's not regretting that they repented. He's regretting that he had to write this to, uh, and, and knew it would wound many of them. Though I did regret it, for I see that that letter grieved you, though only for a while. As it is, I rejoice. Not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting, for you felt a godly grief so that you suffered no loss through us. And then verse 10, for godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret. It's a play on words here. Repent is the word repent in the Greek is metanoia. It is literally meta, change, noia, mind, a change of mind. Repentance is where I, my thoughts have been thinking sinfully and I'm brought by different means. David was brought by the prophet who said, I'm talking about you, David. He was brought to repentance. Sometimes it's you're reading the scriptures uh, where you'll be encountered in the word, be brought to repent, sometimes in prayer. So your mind about the matter changes. You were thinking in a way that was not consistent with the gospel. You were thinking sinfully, and then you're brought to have a change of mind, to agree with God. Have you ever heard somebody say repenting is agreeing with God? To think the way God would have us to think. So watch this play on words here. Godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without repenting. In other words, you don't have a sinful mindset about this, and then you come to realize it's a sinful mindset, and you, and you repent, and you, your mindset takes on, you have a change of mind, takes on that. And then you say, no, no, I'm going to go back here. It says that godly sorrow doesn't do that. Godly sorrow doesn't do that. Whereas worldly grief produces death. The difference, you've seen it. You've raised children, you've seen it. The difference in a child being sorry uh, that he or she got caught with the hand in the cookie jar, you know, sorry for the consequence, not, but not sorry because it was a sin of disobedience of breaking the fifth commandment against their parents. So there's, he makes this contrast between godly sorrow, which leads to repentance, not to be repented of. That's how it reads in the, in the text. Worldly sorrow, which just leads to death. It's a, it's a sorrow, but it doesn't produce change. Sorrow for the implications. And so you, you have that going on there, which I think is very critical uh, in this letter. So he, in chapters 8 and 9, again, he, 
this, the collection not only would assist the poor, but it would, show, it would demonstrate tangibly their concern, the concern of the Gentile Christians in Macedonia and Achaia toward Jewish Christians in Judea. And it would show the powerful transformation that comes when the gospel finds entrance in the body of Christ, okay? Um, this, a couple of words about those who, who were in opposition. They were apparently uh, Jews, either, either Palestinian Jews, Jews from that area, or Hellenistic Jews, perhaps some who had come out of a Greek background. We talked about this in the intertestamental material, who had converted to Judaism. It seemed to be a mixed bag there. And, uh, and they were twisting the minds of the leadership. Paul writes chapters 10 through 13 to expose these deceitful workers and defend that God called him to this work. He didn't take it up on his own. Then let's look at keys, keys to 2 Corinthians. Well, the key phrase, Paul's defense of his authority, the key verses, we read them at the beginning of our session tonight. The key chapters are the chapters 8 and 9, which, which focus on the, the collection. Uh, that's, the, that's the good thing that needs to take place. Uh, in here, you find principles of giving, the purposes for giving, uh, some policies to follow in giving, and the promises that are realized in giving. And so that's, that becomes sort of a critical mass in this whole letter. What about Jesus? In, this, in Paul writing to a, to a church he had established, think about the pain of this, hearing that not only uh, as, he write, as he wrote 1 Corinthians, that they were abusing this, abusing that, <laughs> neglecting this, questioning that. Now he hears that they've turned against him. How is Christ presented here? Well, let's look at in 2 Corinthians 1.5, at the, at the introduction of the letter, uh, he is presented as the believer's comfort. It says, we, for we, as we share abundantly in Christ's suffering, so through Christ. We share abundantly in comfort too. You see what he's doing when you know what the letter's about. Christ suffered. How should we expect not to? We share in his suffering. But Christ also gives us comfort in the gospel. And so he's wanting them to know that what he has to say is going to be painful again, but they can find comfort in Christ. And he himself is finding comfort. He is portrayed as, as the triumph. We read that to you a while ago, 2 Corinthians 2, 14. But thanks be to God who in Christ, and this is, this is so incredibly pervasive, always leads us. You ever feel defeated? Feel like you've wasted your time with someone or in, in, some, in some endeavor for the cause of Christ? Go back and read this. He always leads us in triumphal procession. And through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him every, everywhere, always, everywhere. He set forth as the Lord, 2 Corinthians 4, 5. For we, what we proclaim is not ourselves. And this is what one of the charges was. Well, Paul's just, he's just all about himself. Paul says, no, I'm not proclaiming. I didn't come to proclaim myself, but Jesus Christ as Lord. And then he says, the only reason I was there was we are servants of Christ. And if we're going to proclaim the Lord, we came servants for Jesus' sake to you. He's the light. 2 Corinthians 4, 6, God's, for God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. This is a powerful picture. The God who said by divine fiat, let there be light, spoke that life-giving light in us, shining in our hearts to give us the light Look at how he piles up the words here. Out of darkness, the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. And where do we find? Where do we find this most focused demonstration of the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. In other words, this idea in face-to-face -face communion, in his person, in his work. That's the idea of the face of Christ. Reconciliation, I told you earlier, it's a key word. 2 Corinthians 5, 19, that is in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. Why would it, what does it mean God not counting their trespasses against them? Because, because he lays on Jesus the sins of those for whom he dies, the sins of all who will believe. 
And he gives to us. We carry it out. The message of reconciliation. Do you remember what's in 2 Corinthians 5, 20? We memorized this when I was growing up in church in Royal Ambassadors. Now, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. This, is, this follows right on the heels of this. As though God were beseeching you himself through us, we plead with you in the name of Christ, or in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. That's, that's what follows this. Uh, we've been entrusted with the, the message of reconciliation, which means if we're going to, if we're going to have the message of reconciliation have any kind of power at all, we have to have the message of reconciliation. We ourselves need to be reconcilers. If we're dividers, if we're fussers, if we're fighters, if, we're, if we've offended this and picket that, then the message of the ministry of reconciliation, the message of reconciliation is, is neutered. That's why unity, we're talking about so many times from Ephesians and other places, unity is so critical. Organic unity in the body is so critical. It's, it, it tangibly demonstrates the power of the gospel. And then in 2 Corinthians 5.21, he's our substitute. For, for our sake, he made him, that is Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin. He was sinless. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That great exchange. We are sinful. He is sinless. He takes on our sin and the penalty of our sin so that we by grace through faith, might receive and be clothed in his righteousness, that great exchange in the gospel. And then he is the gift. Look at 2 Corinthians 9, 15. Paul uses this when he's arguing for the collection. Thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. He's talking about how Jesus, who though rich for our sakes, became poor, that we, through his poverty, might become rich. He's the owner, 2 Corinthians 10, 7. Look at what is before your eyes. If anyone is confident that he is Christ, that he belongs to Christ, let him remind himself that just as he is Christ's, so also are we. In other words, why would there anybody who said they belong to Christ have time and breath and energy to undermine me, Paul says. I belong to Christ too. So if you really belong to Christ, you don't have time to, to run down a fellow believer. Certainly, certainly not time to come in and, and un, try to undo the work of the gospel that he's done uh, by God's help in, in Corinth. And then he is our power. Look at 2 Corinthians 12, 9. But he said to me, this is in the midst of the whole the, the thorn in the flesh discussion, remember? I sought the Lord three times. and said, Please remove it, Lord. Remove it. It's, it's hindering me. I, and you can imagine this. You, I can do so much more. If, if this was not a hindrance to me, I could do so much more in, in expend, expender of energy and, and sharing the gospel. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. That's something we need to take in. The devil lies to us and says, you know, your weakness, you, your weakness renders you basically useless. That's the, that's the devil's lie. God says just the opposite. When you are gripped by a sense of your weakness, your inadequacy, then God's grace can be put on display. And when it is through you, no one will say, wow, that person really is. No, no, say, look at look at." the grace of God in that person's life. So Paul says, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses. What was happening? The false apostles were accusing him, pointing out his weaknesses, his, his faults, his flaws. He says, I'll boast the more for them. Because God says he likes to take weak vessels and do great things with them so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. You get the picture, don't you? The self-sufficient guy the guy that says, I got this. You know, you've, if you read some of these memes, so-and-so, he can't do this, this, and the fellow says, oh, yeah, hold my drink. And, you know, this notion of I've got this. No, that's not the attitude of a follower. He's got this. And he's pleased to use me. And so I just humble myself before the Lord, before his mighty hand, that he may lift me up in due time. Well, what about the contribution of Second Corinthians to the, to the whole uh, corpus of, of Scripture? There's a lot of autobiographical material here of Paul because he's defending himself. Uh, and you could say, one writer said, this is the most personal book Paul writes 
out of the, out of the 13 New Testament books uh, he writes. In fact, in fact, it may be the most personal of the entire New Testament, no matter who's writing it. In Romans, when we looked at that, we talked about what a, what a mental giant we see in Paul, this assault that he lays to, to anything contrary to the gospel when he asserts the power of the gospel. Uh, so if his mind is revealed in Romans, his heart is revealed in 2 Corinthians. He lays out things about his character, his motives, his priorities, his desires, his emotions. He puts them all on his sleeve. He talks about personal things about his life that you don't find anywhere else. And without this book, there's some things we wouldn't have known. I want us to look at this and we'll close out with this. We wouldn't have known uh, about uh, uh, the persecution and hardships that are not recorded in the book of Acts. Look at 2 Corinthians 11, 23 to 27. He says, are they servants of Christ? I'm a better one. I'm talking like a madman. You've got to appreciate, get the pathos here. He says, I don't like to do this. But they basically have claimed this for themselves in order to discount me. With far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings, often near death. We would not know this following except for this letter. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Think about this, folks. Jesus underwent that one time, the 39 lashes. Paul says he was beaten five times times like this. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. We only know about one shipwreck in Acts. A night and day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys in danger from rivers, so facing floods, trying to cross rivers, danger from robbers, Danger from my own people, those Jews that were hunting him down. Danger from Gentiles, the people who saw him as someone who came in to turn up upside down their world. Danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers. Now he's talking about the folks who've come into Corinth there. In toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. He's not writing this to say, pity me, pity me. He is challenging those who came in and said, you know, we, we are servants of Christ. Paul is a fraud. Paul says, oh, yeah? Well, let me tell you what this fraud has gone through for the sake of the gospel. These extra details of his escape from Damascus in 2 Corinthians 11, 32 and 33, we wouldn't know about this. Look at this. At Damascus, the governor under King Aretas was guarding the city of Damascus in order to seize me. But I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped his hand. So this, he have running for his life here. His vision and his revelation of this, of this paradise experience he has, 2 Corinthians 12, 1 to 7. We wouldn't know about this without 2 Corinthians. He says, I must go on boasting. And remember now, he is challenging these false apostles, these super apostles who undermined him. And he's taking them on head on. Though there's nothing to be gained by it. In other words, I'm not trying to make you uh, puff myself up here, but, but they've, they've fired the salvo. I had a friend of mine, a pastor friend of mine years ago, who said, if you're going to rattle your sword at me, you better draw your sword because when I hear your sword rattle, my sword's coming out. And that's what you see here in Paul. I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. I know that this man was caught up into paradise. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. There were things about this experience he didn't understand and he dared not try to clarify. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. On behalf of this man, I will boast. But on my own behalf, I will not boast, except of my weakness. So he's, what he's done is he's speaking of himself in the third person here. So that it doesn't appear that he's saying, so what? I've been caught up in vision. Though if I should wish to boast, I would not be a fool, for I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. 
So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelation. So now he identifies himself as this man that he knew 14 years ago. A thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me or to buffet me, to keep me from becoming conceited. An affliction. Not sure what it was. I mean, but a guy who's been beaten nearly to death five times, beaten with rods, uh, it wouldn't be hard to find physical challenges he would have. Some have suggested that his thorn in the flesh was, was an eye problem he had. He was, he was losing his sight, and you'll see in some of his letters. See, see what big letters I write. He had, he had an amanuensis, a secretary who would write for him sometime. And so, and they could be connected. It could be that the beatings and the physical exertion he experienced adversely affected his eyes. And then, of course, there's the thorn in the flesh, 2 Corinthians 12, 7 to 10. So to keep me from being conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. So Paul says, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses. This is where he finally heads with this, not of the revelations at all, but what, what the revelation has brought to me. Was, a, was an affliction, a providential affliction, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I'm content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I'm weak, then I am strong. In other words, I'm, I'm useful to God. So he wants them to understand that while, he has, while he's challenging the, the defamation claims laid toward him by the false apostles, uh, he's, he's not puffing himself up here. He's, con- he's learned to be content and see the value of that. Now, this is interesting. We talked about this when we went uh, studied through Galatians some time ago. The language of this letter is characterized by unusual constructions, broken sentences. Remember in Galatians, Paul gets so angry <laughs> a couple times that you could pick it up in the right. It's just, it's just not even full sentences, just boom, 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 boom. And he says a couple of uh, pretty harsh things. Uh, mixed metaphors. The feelings, uh, the shift in feeling and tone. He, he presses and presses and presses. And then, and it's almost as if under the leadership of the Spirit, he doesn't want them to believe that that's all he feels. And so he, he turns his tone to, to a tone of comfort and encouragement and rejoicing. You pick up something of his emotional stress. One writer said this, said that you could, you could say that 2 Corinthians is the most unsystematic of all of his writings. It's just like he's writing from the heart what's, what's coming to him, to, of, the, of the concern he has for what's happening at Corinth. But in the light of that, I mean, in the midst of that, he still makes some, some strong doctrinal contributions. He takes on this discussion of between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. Um, and while I would differ a little bit with our video in terms of, of what that means, uh, there is a distinction made there. And uh, the difference primarily is the Old Covenant written on tablets of stone, the New Covenant written on the heart, the content of those same tablets of stone. That's where we would probably part uh, with, our, with our video. Uh, he goes into explanation in chapter 4, verses 1 to 7, about the supernatural warfare over receiving the gospel that's in play. Uh, gives a proper perspective on suffering, on the suffering of Christ in chapter 4, 8 through 18. He talks in terms of the resurrection, chapter 5, verses 1 to 13, and the resurrection of believers. As I said earlier, he describes the ministry of reconciliation and the double imputation of Christ, that, that Christ takes on our sin and we take on his righteousness. Imputed guilt for Christ, imputed righteousness for us. Calls them out to separate from the world. Eight and nine, one of the best sections to study on, on Christian giving. And then he exposes the strategies of Satan. And I want us to look at this for a minute. Look at these verses here. Second Corinthians 2, 10 to 11. Anyone whom you forgive, I also forgive. Indeed, what I have forgiven, if I've forgiven anything, has been for your sake in the presence of Christ so that we would not be outwitted by Satan. Why would he say that? What does the devil want us to do? And in the context here of, this, of the discipline issue, 
One of the things he'd like for the church to do is just ignore discipline. Just let the church membership fill up with people who, who are no different from the world and, and neuter the power and the witness of the church. When I began to undertake reformation at the First Baptist Church of Clinton many, many years ago now, we were sitting down talking to people. I think I've told you this some time ago. And the deacons had signed a resolution. We presented to the church for the church to adopt. And more than one member said to me, you know, I might have considered signing that thing until I looked at the names of the people who were on there. It's a scathing rebuke. I went to the police jury meeting one night to speak because in that parish, the police jury was asserting I wanted to change the ordinance where you could have, you could have bars open until 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning on Sunday morning. The law at that time was that the bars had to close down at midnight. And so I went to speak against that proposal representing our church. And one of the police jurors, I'll never forget it, stood up and said, well, I don't know what the big deal is, Reverend. Some of your members are some of our best customers. It was, uh, there was, it was awful, the reputation. The devil wants the church to do nothing in terms of holiness and purity so that its reputation is blemished and its power is neutered. But if he can't get the church to be paralyzed in that and put them on ice, then he would hope that there would be an overzealousness, a, a purge mentality, a legalism, a pharisaical legalism that, that there's, you, you, don't, you don't fit, you don't qualify. You've got to stay out of both ditches. Satan's don't be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his design. 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. The God of this world, the devil, blinds the minds of unbelievers. What are we doing when we go share the gospel with our friends and, and our neighbors and our loved ones and our co-workers and even enemies? We're just shining the light of the gospel into blinded eyes. We can't open their blinded eyes. We try to faithfully shine, faithfully shine, until one day they go, I think I see something. Remember Pilgrim's Progress? The evangelist says to Pilgrim, go to the wicked gate, the small gate, the narrow gate, and there you'll be show, shown what to do with your burden. He said, where? I don't know where it is. He said, do you see yonder light? He said, I, I think I may see the light. He said, then walk toward the light until you see the gate. That's what we're doing in gospel ministry because the God of this world has blinded everyone you know who is not a follower of Christ. He's blind to the gospel. And so we just faithfully preach and pray and shine for the day when the Lord opens their eyes. 2 Corinthians 11, 3, but I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Here's the deal here. If the false apostles, if the super apostles can convince these people that Paul is a fraud, what can the devil do with that? His message is a fraud. Paul knows what's at stake here. And you've seen it. You've, you've seen situations where, where pastors, preachers who, who seemingly were used maybe fall into adultery or something, and, and there are people converted into their ministry who are just wrecked. They're ruined. The devil knows that. So Paul is warning them about don't, don't, don't make the distinction. Gospel communicators are imperfect, but they communicate a perfect gospel. Balaam's donkey was used by God to speak the truth, okay? Just remember that, and don't, don't let the devil play havoc with you. 2 Corinthians 11, verses 13 to 15. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, distinguishing themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. I've told you before, you, the devil doesn't come as he's portrayed in the movie The Exorcist and a lot of this real just dark, graphic gore. He's an angel of light. Uh, he, he inspires songs like, if loving you is wrong, I don't want to be right. 
things like that. It's very seductive, very subtle. And he says, so it's no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. His servants, the devil's servants, their end will co- correspond to their deeds. And then 2 Corinthians twelve seven. so to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan. So here's a situation where just as the Lord used Satan in the book of Job, remember the devil is God's devil. We don't have a clash of titans here. We have the author and owner of the universe and a fallen angel who's who's not nearly as big as he thinks he is. He's a wounded animal, so he's a dangerous animal. So here, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. And so that's kind of the, that's an overview of of 2 Corinthians. It's a fantastic letter. Um, be a great letter to study through sometime. But I hope if you haven't read it, you'll go, and, go through and read it with these backgrounds to it, uh, and it'll maybe open up and help you even understand better what we're looking at in 1 Corinthians. All these problems Paul was calling to their attention that need to be fixed. They didn't go through and fix everything. They began to rebel against his teaching. And so 2 Corinthians was necessitated to call them to repentance in that. Questions, comments, observations? Yes.